folks. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. And we'll, we will be starting in about 30 seconds. We're just going to wait for folks to file in from the waiting room. We'll be starting momentarily. And uh, while we wait, uh, for those that are um, have made it in already, uh, if you'd like, certainly no obligation, um, no pressure. But uh, if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, feel free uh, to let us know in the uh, chat uh, where you're joining us from tonight. So feel free to uh, type in the city or town that you are watching from. Again, certainly no obligation, but uh, always a fun little icebreaker. All right, so we get some more folks filing in, but uh, out of respect for those that are here on time, we will get started. All right, let me bring up my screen. And here we go. Great. So good evening and thanks for being with us for the next hour. Best-selling author Luann Rice is here to discuss her latest book, The Shadow Box, in conversation with author Elmar in this Zoom webinar. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, before I disappear for the night, just wanted to make a few quick points. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes for making this event possible. This is a collaboration between several Merrimack Valley libraries here in Massachusetts, including Andover, Boxford, Chumsford, Dracut, Groveland, Haverhill, Littleton, North Reading, Salisbury, Tewksbury, Westford and Wilmington. I'd also like to give a big thank you for uh, Jane, uh, Jane Stiles at Wellesley Books for being our bookstore partner. And I also wanna give a special thank you to Brittany Russell from Amazon. Uh, second, um, know that this event is being live streamed on the library's Facebook page. I know some of you are watching there and uh, please uh, feel free to give the video a like and share it with your friends. Uh, third, uh, you'll all be receiving a feedback survey from me uh, via email tomorrow. Uh, please uh, take 60 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events here at the library. Um, also in the survey will be a link to purchase an autographed copy of Luann's latest book, The Shadow Box uh, from Wellesley Books and 10% of each sale will benefit the participating libraries. And I'll also include information on Elle's books as well. And then finally, just to set expectations, I anticipate tonight's event to last approximately an hour. Uh, Luann and Elle will essentially have a conversation. Uh, Elle will you know, interview Luann for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then they'll take some questions from the audience. So audience members should type their questions into the Q&A box. Uh, comments will go in the comments box. All right, so let me introduce L and Luann. Uh, L first. Uh, so originally from Sacramento, L Mar graduated from UC San Diego before moving to France, where she earned a master's degree from the Sorbonne University in Paris. She now lives and writes in Oregon with her husband, son, and one very demanding feline. Her debut thriller, The Missing, the Missing Sister, was a number one Amazon bestseller, number one in the Kindle store, an Amazon charts bestseller, featured in Woman's World and named one of Pop Sugar's 31 thrillers of 2020. Words she's written can be found on Crime Reads and Criminal Element. For more information and updates on her next thriller, connect with her online at www. E L L E M A R R dot com uh, on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and her upcoming thriller, Lies We Bury, which I'm very excited about, will be available on April 1st. And uh, next, let me introduce Luann, uh, who needs no introduction, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, Luann Rice is the New York Times best-selling author of 35 novels that have been translated into 24 languages. Several of Luann's novels have been adapted for television, including Crazy in Love for TNT, Blue Moon for CBS, Follow the Stars Home and Silver Bells for the Hallmark Hall of Fame, and Beach Girls for Lifetime. Rice is a creative affiliate 
uh, of the Safina Center, an organization that brings together scientists, artists, and writers to inspire a deeper connection with nature, especially the sea. Rice is also an avid environmentalist and advocate for families affected by domestic violence. Uh, and she lives on the Connecticut shoreline. All right, so let's all give a big virtual round of applause to Elle and Luann for joining us here tonight. And Elle, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robert, and the entire Tewksbury Library and all of the other libraries who are participating in this. This is such a special event, and I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you, Luann, first and foremost, for uh, allowing me to be here in conversation with you. Elle, I'm so excited to be talking to you. Um, and on, in this forum, especially because I've just enjoyed our personal conversations, but also thank you, Robert. Thank you to Tewksbury Library and Mary Mac Libraries and to everybody who's watching tonight on a snowy evening in New England, stopping by writers on a snowy evening. Um, so we're very glad that you're here. And uh, Elle, it's just great to be hanging out with you. It is, it is so fun. Um, I. I'm a huge fan. You've had such an incredible literary career with publishing 36 books now, this being number 36, The Shadow Box. I took the time to coordinate in case anyone <laughs> has noticed. Oh my gosh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I did, very happy to be here. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more about how you came to writing, how you began this very prolific path and also discuss the shadow box itself, uh, no spoilers, of course, uh, your inspiration and any advice you have for aspiring authors. So we've got a full agenda. We have a full agenda. And <laughs> I would like to say too that I've become a big fan of yours. I read The Missing Sister and loved it. And we, I'm sure we'll talk about Paris at some point, having both lived there. But I loved the way you wove setting into the story that was absolutely unputdownable. And I feel like I may have, I didn't do it on purpose, but I think I coordinated with. I think you did. Lies we bury your, your up in April. <laughs> Thank um, you. That's so kind. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I don't know. So I, I started, um, you know, in some ways I feel as if there was no other choice for me in, in terms of life and career. If I never have thought, called writing a career. I guess I think of it as calling or just part of who I am. Um, I never set out to be a writer. I think that I was very lucky in that, um, you know, I started very young and I began making sense of my world through writing. And a lot of what I wrote about at that time was nature. Um, I wrote a lot of nature poems that were not very good, but I was able to express what I felt about the world. Um, I think I was also writing about my family and things that were maybe painful. Um, we were one of those families. Actually, it's funny. I was talking to my agent of many, many years today, Andrea Cirillo, and we were talking about Pat Conroy and beach music and how Pat Conroy to me is one of the writers who writes about family that he loves them so much, but there was so much pain and so much sort of difficulty mm -hmm. getting to it. And that was sort of me. So I think that's how I started writing is that, you know, I, my family and I are, you know, very, very close and loved each other so much, but there was a lot that was in the way. And yeah. to have writing as that, you know, as that um, just, I don't know, like an outlet or a, a way through it mm -hmm. um, was incredible, you know, so that's how it started, Absolutely. you know, and then as I, I think as I, um, you know, I would never have thought of publishing, but my mother was an English teacher. My father sold typewriters. So in a way it was <sighs> left me that I'd be a writer. It is, it sounds like it was. And she was the one who, she would, she would send my poems to newspapers and magazines and places, you know, and that's how I first got published. And I God, used to, Mom. you wrote something and it showed up in print. I had no clue that it was something more complicated than that till actually till I dropped out of college and began trying to, you know, publish. And then I realized. Yeah, there are a few obstacles there occasionally. <laughs> well, that's so special. I can definitely see how writing could have been cathartic. And uh, also you mentioned that your love of nature really began your love of writing or maybe one beget the other. Uh, 
you are an avid environmentalist, uh, which I think is evident from certainly the shadow box and then also from many of your books. Uh, what, when did that love affair begin? Did you, have you always lived near the water? Yeah, I mean, I did, I grew up, you know, I'm very lucky. The house I'm in right now, um, that you can sort of see some of it. My grandparents built it. It's in Old Lyme, Connecticut. So it's my wow. sound. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky to still have this place and full of ghosts and full of echoes of my childhood. Um, and it, it is, it's on the beach or it's above the beach. And, you know, so I grew up loving you know, the ocean and, and everything around it, the marshes and the swamps and the, you know, the coastal woodlands and everything. Um, and then where I, you know, other places I've lived too, I've always been drawn to that. And I kind of early on became interested in protecting, you know, what was here. Because just, you know, and especially in my lifetime, watching things uh, go away, you know, be developed or habitats being destroyed, um, species becoming endangered. And I feel like it's really important, and I don't know about you, Elle, but you know, as a fiction, as a writer of fiction, I think we spoke about this at, at one point, probably having to do with other topics rather than environmentalism. But when you're writing a book about something you're passionate about, it's not like you're trying to convince your reader, this is how it should be. This is what you should think or feel, but it's what we think or feel. And we're expressing it in a way that comes through our characters. And so I guess that's how I feel like I'm not trying to change anyone's mind or you know, anything, but just telling you what I think and how I feel that maybe deep down, I do hope that it will make somebody love their environment so much that they'll, you know, want to save it. I love that. I think that's so great. And I definitely feel similarly. I, I don't think that um, I've, I only have two books that I've written so far. So I'm extremely green in comparison to your amazing 36 published. My second book, thank you. <laughs> Um, but I, I found that I can't seem to write a story without imbuing at least one character's perspective with my own or influencing that with my own. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's not, that character doesn't drive the entire story or even isn't necessarily the protagonist, but I can't seem to write without at least layering in things that I feel passionate about. I love that your passion for the environment makes its way into your stories. And I definitely think that's evident in the shadow box. I love the description of the Connecticut shoreline. It's so beautiful. Is that, is it as beautiful in real life as it is in your book? It is. It's, it's so beautiful. And as a matter of fact, and I know we're going to speak about my friend, Cynthia McFadden, as we go on in our conversation, but I was texting with her earlier today and she said, it's like right now, I mean, we are in the midst of this winter wonderland here. You just wouldn't believe how gorgeous it is. Oh. Although if you look on my Instagram page, you'll see something I posted earlier. Um, but I, she said, it, it's like being in, a, she said, I'm happy being in our snow globe. Oh. In her snow globe. <laughs> said, I feel like there's no more, on a day like this, there's no more beautiful place than the Connecticut shoreline and the lower Connecticut river. It's just, it really is. It's very, very beautiful and special. I love that. That sounds amazing. I am from California. I am uh, calling into this where I live now in, in Portland, Oregon, but uh, snow is very exotic to me. So everyone on the East Coast that's experiencing this uh, winter storm that's grown up with it, um, I, I think the photos are so beautiful and we definitely got a good um, dumping of snow for Portland, six to eight inches last weekend, but- um, You live in a gorgeous, extreme area. I mean, it's so beautiful in Portland. I, and, and it is, everywhere. it's gorgeous. Yeah. But I, I definitely, I grew up in California, um, not not in the snowy regions of California. I saw some from Gardena also in the chat. Um, and so whenever it does snow here, I am just in love. It's totally breathtaking. And I can imagine that uh, is the case for the Connecticut shoreline right now in your snow globe. What a great way to put it. Yeah, she was that she called it when she said that absolutely i love that um i would love to uh get into a little bit about the shadow box um just because it is such an amazing book and it did just release it was an amazon first read um via our publisher amazon publishing and thomas and mercer 
Um, so I got it back in January uh, and I just plowed through it. It's an amazing story. Um, and I understand that there are characters uh, or rather the setting is the same as your first thriller, Last Day. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your your switch or maybe not a switch exactly because you had suspense elements in your stories before, but your, your dive into the thriller genre with your first book, Last Day, Last Summer, that came out last summer. And then um, this, your second thriller, The Shadow Box. How did that transition happen? Was that a conscious decision or do you just realize that you wanted to spend more time with those suspense psychological elements? Um, so I've always loved thrillers and mysteries. I, you know, I grew up on Nancy Drew and my mother was an English teacher, as I mentioned, and she really loved um, English mysteries. So a lot of Dorothy Sayers and Agatha Christie. Um, I think my tastes ran a little more dark than that as I got older. Uh, but my, you know, my earlier novels were really more classic, you know, fiction, just having, having to do a lot with families and relationships. Uh, Universal themes. Yeah, true. Um, but, it, you know, it's so funny. I've never thought of anything as a theme. I've, I've, and you may be that way, too. I just, I start with a character and the character sort of tells the story. And if somebody says it's a theme or someone says it's this, I'll, you know, go along with it. But it's kind of whatever has interested me at, at any given time. That makes uh, sense. Yeah. And, and I've never, you know, I don't, I, I, so that's it. Like, it's sort of my taste and what is driving me, you know, inside, internally, mm -hmm. um, psychologically, I would say too. So maybe at some point along the way, actually, definitely at some point along the way for last day was based on a real life murder story that affected my family, that affected um, the, the man I was married to at the time was a witness in a murder trial. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, it was rather well known. And it's been on all the all the TV shows on all the true crime shows and everything. And it's about um, somebody who, a, a woman who was strangled while she was pregnant and left in their air conditioned bedroom and her husband was out on a sailing trip at the time. And in real life, that was a true life person who was a friend of my husband, Henry. And he wow. was an alibi witness because he was on the boat and he said, yeah, he was here. You know, so when they found his wife's body he was far, far away. And that affected our family a great deal. Um, his daughter, um, one of his daughters became the sort of the star witness in the trial because she, um, you know, he had claimed he was miles away when, you know, when her body was found and when she was killed. And yet, you know, the day he was arrested, the day the you know, he was arrested. I was with the two girls and we were in a car and the youngest sister said, dad, you know, he, he couldn't have done it, right? I mean, we know him, he couldn't have done it. And Henry said, of course he couldn't have done it. We were out on the boat when this all went down. And besides, we were all in the kitchen when he called his wife and we all heard him saying, I love you, call me if you need me. And his other daughter said, but dad, I picked up the extension in the hall and he was talking to a ringing phone. And so <laughs> she became the star witness. And Oh my God. Uh, wow. And I guess I couldn't really not write about that just because it was so, it, and I mean, last day, just like the shadow box, they, it's very, it's about the crime. It's about the investigation, but it's more, they're both more about how these crimes affect the people involved, how they mm -hmm. affect the families, and not just the families of the victim or the killer, but everybody who was a witness, everybody's mm -hmm. neighbor. It's, you know, murder is just so something that, unless it's touched you in some way, you might not be able to realize how deeply and completely and probably forever it affects you. Absolutely. Those ripple effects, um, I'm sure, continue on and on the trauma of that lived experience. And then I think the trauma that a community might feel, um, whether that's a, a 
a single family or a town, I can only imagine how how much that would be affecting over time and how, especially if it's unsolved, you really never, I imagine the closure would be non-existent and how difficult that would be to move on. But it sounds like there was, at least with your, yes. this in situation this, that occurred. In this case, it was solved. It was, you know, he was convicted, but it's true that the whole community to this day, and this was a long time ago, the, the murder took place in 1985. And so it's been a long time, but it's still, you still feel the ripple effects. You can still feel, you know, and, and as a matter of fact, um, I had a very long conversation two days ago with a fantastic organization, a wonderful woman, Catherine Verano and Melissa Zychek at Safe Futures, which is a domestic violence clinic here in Southeastern Connecticut. And they're planning an amazing new center. And we were talking about that. And she met, Kathy mentioned that somebody on her Facebook page had seen something that she posted about the shadow box. Because I mentioned, I acknowledged them in the back of the book um, because of, you know, connections in the shadow box with domestic violence. And she said that one of the, uh, the district attorneys, the prosecutors had seen what she posted and remembered me being at the trial all those years back. So, you know, cause I, I sat through the killer's trial every day and I was very touched to like know that he even noticed me, but also that, you know, he remembered, but that's how long people have thought about this here. You know, it is a small area. So you're right about that. Yeah, my goodness. That sounds like a, a pretty incredible experience. And I'm sure that touched your writing in certain ways as well. Um, what other aspects of your stories draw inspiration from real life or maybe true crime. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Sure. I think anything that touches you so deeply that, you know, I was going to say anything that touches you so deeply, you can't go on. You have to write about. And what made me think of that, and I, this isn't something to for us to talk about for a long time, but Today um, is the is the birthday of a of a really dear friend of mine who was murdered, and when he was thirty three, and it was a it was a um, it was a rather random thing. It wasn't like the Ed story with the last day story where a man killed his wife. This was just a random thing, but I think that that sudden loss sudden violent loss and what it does to tear people apart has really um, affected me and inspired me. And obviously, the and, and his name was Dennis Shortell, that friend, um, was a beach friend from where I am right now. It, it, you know, I call it Hubbard's Point, but mm -hmm. uh, an old line. And, you know, and I just have never stopped thinking of the day I heard that he'd been murdered. And I feel as if that probably affected me. I was pretty young. He was, you know, we were both very young at the time. Um, but his, you know, I knew his wife very well. I knew his three children. I knew his brother, wow. I knew his best friend. I mean, we grew up together. Yeah. And, and so I think that things like that for a writer are, how can you escape them? I mean, why would you even want to? It's sort of what you owe the dead and what you owe the memory of your friend is to at least feel it enough to let it into your writing. And that yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead. I was just um, going to comment. I think that's so well put. And also um, we mentioned universal themes earlier. Trauma, grief, loss, um, death, and sometimes murder, those are things that um, you know other people experience that we all experience to one degree or another, um, which is why I think it's if it is affecting to us as writers, it's important to then speak that, to speak that truth and let someone else uh, experience that emotional resonance, hopefully, and to offer maybe that catharsis to someone else, or maybe just that journey to go on for 300 pages. Right. And I don't know that we set out to do that intentionally. I, I don't think I do, but that seems to have been something I've felt from my readers is that it's something I hear about from them is that those stories mean a lot to them. Either they've been through something or, you know, they've, it's touched them in some ways. And often the loss or the, the violence isn't murder. You know, it isn't necessarily so extreme, but it can be something else that, uh, 
we're able to somehow give voice to, I guess. And absolutely. Yeah. And you, um, one, uh, theme, and this isn't giving anything away. It's in, um, the book description, uh, one, maybe not theme, but issue is, uh, in the shadow box is domestic violence. And, um, I think that's, uh, to your point, not necessarily big, brash, violent actions. It um, can be much more subtle, much more insidious um, mm -hmm. in terms of physical, or not physical, but verbal, emotional abuse as well. Yes, and that's a, something I, I feel is so important to talk about, and I'm really glad that you asked me. Um, it's true. So in the shadow box, and it's not the first novel I've written that has touched on domestic violence. But in this one, I feel as if it's taken to a, a really great extreme. And there is a case in Connecticut right now, which is uh, the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. And she, you know, she's been, um, her husband, uh, Fotis Dulos was arrested for her murder. Uh, her body was never found, but there, were there was evidence that she had she had expressed that she'd been abused emotionally um and she wasn't granted a restraining order she you know asked for one and didn't receive one and one day to um, to june i believe it was may maybe may, it was memorial day weekend um 2019 i believe she disappeared after dropping her kids off at school and it's been a very big case in Connecticut and probably I'm sure. has heard of it or many people have heard of it. It's been on lots of shows and things like that. But um, I was very affected by that because it's, to me, I think a lot about how domestic violence, emotional abuse leads to something more serious. And yet there's nothing more serious already than those things. If you're being you know, if you're being emotionally abused, um, it can destroy you. It can leave you a really broken person and like a shell of who you used to be or who you thought you used to be. And so I'm a really strong advocate of um, believing people who, and not just, I shouldn't even say believing people. It's so complicated. I would say believing yourself. If you're somebody who feels like this is happening to you, it's happening to you. And a lot of the dynamic has to do with being told it's not real, it's not that bad, you're imagining it. If you were nicer, I'd be different. If you weren't so demanding, I'd be different. Um, if you understood me, I'd be different. There's so many dynamics to it, but it has this effect of chipping someone down and beating them down in a way. And you know, it did, it did happen to me many, many years ago. Um, and when it did happen, I will say that I became a different person. I didn't recognize who I was. And part of the problem was that you're in two mindsets. You're in the mindset that this is horrible. I'm out of here. Then in you, you're in the mindset, but I love the person. And, you know, they're suffering or they're this or they're that. And you stay. And every, you know, and, and there's like... Um, it's called the wheel of abuse, the cycle of abuse. And you can look it up, but it basically is, it, it happens every time in almost every case where um, there's like a buildup of tension, a blow up of tension, a cooling down. The woman, normally it's a woman, it could be a man, but the person who is the, the victim, I don't like that word, but will say, I'm out of here. And then the other one lures you back in and says, I'm sorry, it will never happen again. I love you. It's okay, and that, and you, you say, okay, I'll give it another try, and they, they call that the honeymoon phase, and they say that's the most dangerous part of the cycle, where you really do lose a little bit more of yourself by giving in. But um, I, I would, you know, I was very lucky, and I found a place that helped me, and I would just encourage anyone who might be listening or watching to believe what you're feeling, believe what you're thinking and know that it's real. And 
you know, know that like in the back of the shadow box, there are resources, but um, one of them is, as I mentioned earlier, safe futures here in Connecticut, and you can look them up and no matter where you live, you can reach out to them. Um, but I just think that it's just so important to find your own strength and your own self. And sometimes when you're in that place, you can't because you're so sort of turned upside down. It, you're still that person. You're still that strong person, but you've kind of lost belief in yourself. I, I think um, not only do you have your personal experience that you just shared, but also you're such an amazing advocate. You support, as you said, safe futures and the domestic violence clinic in uh, Georgetown University. Um, the There's a quote included um, that actually I went on Goodreads and I, I looked around to see what people were saying um, that really resonated with uh, certain readers um, that said, and I'll paraphrase, justice was its own art, helping women know that their experience, no matter how horrific was their strength, it showed them that they were their own superheroes. And I just, I loved that. I thought it was so well put, so poetic, and then also just so um, supportive and to the point cutting through any of that uncertainty and hesitation that uh, you mentioned before that some women or victims, people in these intimate partnerships that have gone poorly um, might doubt themselves over. And um, I think that's such a great way to put it. It shows them that they were their own superheroes. I think it's really true. And, and even if you're not out of it yet, you're still your own superhero. I, 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 I think that that's the most important thing to know that it's, you know, it's also like the ruby slippers. I think of it that way too, that, you know, it's within you at any given time and you just, you know, click your heels three times and you're out of there. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> uh, I also read in the acknowledgements that um, there is a character in the shadow box that's based on a real person. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So I think I mentioned earlier, my friend Cynthia McFadden, who is a, um, a wonderful, wonderful journalist uh, on NBC News, and she's often on the Today Show. And she does stories that are so in-depth and so emotional and so uh, wrenching. You know, she goes to the heart of whatever is difficult, like whatever the hardest thing in the world is, that's Cynthia, she's following it down. And um, We've known each other for quite a while now. She, Cynthia has a house out here in Connecticut, um, not too far from, from where I live. And, you know, I get to see her quite a bit and hang out with her. And I love talking to her about work, you know, and about what her stories are and, and hearing like what leads her into those stories. And one of the things that like really um, is amazing is that she's an advocate for people, for families, for women, for children, for whoever needs her. And I honestly really feel it's that way. She might not see it that way, but I feel like it's whoever needs her, Cynthia is there for them. That's um, so wonderful. Yeah, in a really big way. And she's had a couple of like tremendous stories this year in particular um, that have been, you know, very life-changing. Like she, she delved into the uh, mica, mica mining industry in Madagascar, wow. where who knew? I didn't know this, but mica is used in so many products in America. Um, almost, I mean, practically everything uses mica. And to get to it, they have to go deep into the earth, into these really narrow, narrow tunnels. And the only people that can get into them are little tiny children. So like little kids, like three years old, are being sent into, and, and you know, forced to do this extremely uh, dangerous work and for pennies. And Cynthia went down there and exposed it. And she had a broken foot at the time, I must add. But that, wow. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and she and her team at NBC have won lots of awards for that, for that work. Um, well deserved, it sounds like. Well deserved. And she, I, I, I used her as, um, actually, I shouldn't say I used her. She came to me or, the way, I don't know about you, Elle, and I'd love to ask you about this, but about writing and how you come up with characters. But in my story, um, you know, Claire, the main character who was, had been attacked and left for dead, and she is hiding out 
in the wilds of, you know, this sort of very protected area. Um, and she's on her own, you know, she's trying to figure out who attacked her, what happened, um, all of it. And meanwhile, sort of in the distance somewhere else, there's this woman who is working to as a crusader really for, for domestic violence victims and for people who have been affected by this kind of behavior. And it turns out that they actually have a connection. Um, and so Claire Boudry Chase is the main character and this other character, and I won't go into it too much, is uh, Spencer Graham Fenwick. And that is the woman who was inspired by, by Cynthia. But it wasn't till I was well into the novel that I was like, Claire needs somebody to help save her. I'm like, oh, Cynthia. <laughs> so yeah. Character. And, and I love that um, that person to help save her is um, rooted in reality, that there, uh, you know, there are people willing to help others in these terrible situations. There are organizations much like Safe Futures and Domestic Violence Clinic at Georgetown. It's really true. And this, the Domestic Violence Clinic at Georgetown, I'd like to say a moment about that. So I, um, I didn't go to Georgetown, but when I was young, I was married to someone who was in law school at Georgetown, and I used to go with him to classes. And back then, you didn't have to show ID, you could just go to classes. And I felt as if I had this incredible legal education. For That's amazing. I know. <laughs> and I, I've used the law in so many of my novels. And at one point, I called Georgetown and said, you know, I feel guilty. Like, I write about you guys all the time how much was tuition back then? And it was like shockingly low. If I told you, you'd be oh. surprised. And um, so I gave them, you know, I said, well, I'm going to pay for my tuition. So I gave them the money. Oh, and wow. I, <laughs> That's so nice. And I wound up getting, being in touch with a woman named Deborah Epstein, who's a dean of the law school. And Deborah is, has become a very good friend of mine. And Deborah also is a tremendous advocate for victims of domestic violence. And they have they have, Georgetown has one of the best clinic systems of any law school in, in, in the country. And Deborah um, really, you know, has much to do. I think she, I believe she maybe runs all of them, but she's, maybe she's the dean. I'm, I don't know, I'm going to say this wrong because oh. I'm not an academic. But um, the point is, she is such an advocate for victims of domestic violence. And the students, they advocate for their clients. They go to court. They do pro bono work. They, That's they, incredible. Yeah, and I feel like they learn it on both sides. They learn it from the actual clients coming in and talking to them about what they've been to, and then they see what it ha what happens in the courts, like how hard it is, or or how challenging it is really to, you know, to um, make sure that they're well represented. So anyway, shout out to Deborah Epstein. Yeah, that's pretty wonderful. What an incredible experience to be able to sit in on law school classes and gain an education and then also to, to pay it back several years later and then to become involved and pay it back in a whole other way to support the domestic violence clinic there. That's really fun. Thanks, um, you mentioned something about uh, earlier, you mentioned something about um, writing and how, whether we begin with these ideas or, or where they go while we're writing, do you have a, uh, would you say that you plot everything out or are you more of an organic writer that goes with wherever your characters take you? I've never plotted anything. It always starts with a character. Um, a single <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah. I, how about you? How do you do it? I, well, I, sorry, I had that reaction because I love writing that way, but I, um, don't have the time to do it anymore. <laughs> um, writing under contract is different than it was uh, writing without a contract. Um, so I love the idea of just writing and seeing what the story takes you. I tend to plot chapters now. I really? plot every chapter. Do you plot chapter by chapter or do you plot within the chapter too? I allow the story to kind of unfold itself within the chapter. I don't do scene by scene. So I have an idea of where, how the chapter begins and then how it ends to propel into the next chapter. Um, but I think it's so fun to enjoy the discovery, if you will, alongside your characters, uh, as I think you're saying that you write. Do you, can I ask you, did you, did you study writing? 
or did you just become a writer, so to speak? I mean, however that works. Yeah, however that works. <laughs> uh, no, I, I did not study writing. I um, always loved English class and I always joyfully read every recommended book on my English class list. Um, that, yeah, I'm just, I was always a big reader. And um, eventually I started writing myself stories. Um, if I couldn't get my hands on one, I would start to write myself stories as a kid. Well, that's what about you? Well, I, I just want to say one more thing about you. I loved, so I love The Missing Sister and we talked a little bit before about living in Paris and it's so incredibly, it's not just atmospheric, but you, I felt as if the fact that that novel went into a very dark place and literally into the dark place of the catacombs and was, I mean, it was edge of my seat reading that book. Um, it was, Thank you. Did you, when you lived in Paris, did you ever go to the catacombs? I, not when I lived there. I um, lived about 30 minutes north, but I uh, went back during one of my mini visits back once I moved back home to the United States. Um, I went down into the catacombs and was, first of all, surprised that I didn't know they existed before um, mm -hmm. because they're such an incredible bit of history beneath modern Paris. Um, so it was, I started writing, I started writing The Missing Sister before I went down to the catacombs and then was able to go back and flesh out some more specific details um, to make it a little bit more, um, hopefully visceral. They were, but, they were absolutely visceral, it was fantastic. Thank you, that's very kind. Yeah, I can't wait to, you know, I, as I mentioned, our lovely, we share a publicist, wonderful Brittany Russell, and she just sent me this lovely book, Lies We Bury, and I'm going to start it tonight. I wish I'd been able to read it before we talked tonight, but um, there's, Thank snow, you. there's a lot of storms and it, it probably was delayed a bit, but it's also, I love the cover. Thank you. I love it too. Um, Shasti O'Leary Sudan designed it. Oh my God. She, she designed this one. I know. Yeah, I know. Let's do a shout out to Shesty. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. She's incredible. She's incredible. Yeah, she did a great job with this one. And it's so, I, I, you know, and it's funny when you have faces on a cover, it, it's tricky because it can be so specific, but there's something about this that's, it's like universal. There's like a cry for help in this child's face that is so poignant. Like all I, I want to yeah. know is what happened. What can we do to save this little baby? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I um, I feel the same way. I didn't. I was blown away when I first saw the cover. So thank yeah. you. I'm glad that that um, has that effect. It's, uh, it's great. Um, yeah, I appreciate you um, holding my book up. That's so fun to see it in your hands. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, I think we do have uh, some questions, both in the chat box, and then there were some questions submitted in advance. Um, I'm going to say this first question because it was it was my next question for you personally. Um, Teresa had asked, "What is the best piece of writing advice that you received that you still use?" Hmm. Um. I would say, and this is, I don't know that it's some, I guess I would say write every day um, and trust yourself. They go together. I like that. I could say a lot more about that, of course, and I'm sure you could too, but I think those two things. Excellent. Write every day and trust yourself. I, I love that. I definitely agree with both of those bits of advice. Great question. Mm -hmm. uh, Krista had asked, um, prior to the beginning of this, will there be a continuation book to the secret language of sisters? Oh, what a sweet question. I love that because a lot of people do ask me about Tilly and Rue. It's one of my young, it was my first young adult novel with Scholastic, my amazing editor, Amy Friedman. And um, it might be, actually, there might be. I think that you might have to bring back Rue and Newton. And if you've read the novel, you'll know what that means. Krista knows what it means. Yeah. And let's do a shout out to my editor at Thomas and Mercer, Liz Pearsons, who is a wonderful editor. And I feel so lucky that she believes in me and that she has, you know, let me write two novels for her, for, for them. Um, and, you know, and link them to some extent. I'm very lucky. 
which have each been hugely successful. So I'm sure she feels the same way about you. Thank you. Uh, we also have a question in the chat box uh, from, I believe, Diane. What authors do you read for pleasure, Luann? Um, so, oh, that's a very good question because so many. I just- I have I, the same question myself. Oh, good. Um, there's so many. I actually just, well, I just read The Missing Sister by El I recommend that highly. Thank you. I just read a novel by um, Robert Dugoni, his most recent, and it's a thriller and incredible. Um, I just read Win by Harlan Coben, and that is also incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, Tammy Hogue, uh, Kristen Hanna has a new book out, The Four Winds, and that is extraordinary. And Kristen wrote the, you know, she's written many, many beloved novels, and one that's she has oh, yeah um yep and so what else um but kind of going back a ways like to when i was and many more like i mean oh gosh i mean alice hoffman if you're in boston i mean if you're anywhere in the world you know and love alice hoffman but if you're in boston you probably feel she's one of your own and all of her magic novels are magical and she's she's also a very good friend and i adore her and love her um, so I read anything Alice writes, um, but kind of going back a long, long time, Laurie Colwyn was a favorite of mine. She wrote short stories for the New Yorker magazine and also a few novels, but, and her stories were then collected um, into books, but she's a very, very favorite. Uh, my absolute favorite books are two. One is Islands in the Stream by Hemingway. And it's about mm -hmm. siblings and it's because I have two sisters and I think he, oh, oh wait, I mean, I shouldn't say it's just about siblings. It's about families, but Franny and Zoe by Salinger is about siblings. And that really hits home to me with my two sisters. Um, we loved it when we were young and it really, to me, it sums up the idea of a family that is a little bit eccentric and loves each other a lot and is very kind of wistful, so. What an amazing list. There's a lot more. I know the minute we talk about something else, I'm going to have way, way more. <laughs> of course. Well, Diane also had another question. She asks, what is your writing routine like? Time of day or place or any other details you have to offer and share? Um, I believe in, I get up early and I guess early is relative to people, but lately I've been getting up right at sunrise. Um, Actually, I get up because my cats wake me up. I have four cats. <laughs> they want to be fed. And so they wake me up and I feed them. So that's first thing. And then great alarm clocks. Oh yeah. <laughs> Very great. And I sometimes go back to bed for a little while, but often I don't. I make coffee, I go to my desk, and I start writing. And I have this belief in writing before you say a word out loud to anybody. Oh. And to just I kind of believe in using whatever came to you in the night through your dreams um, and through your rest and then coming to your desk with it. And especially, I remember my mother um, was, as I mentioned twice now, was an English teacher. And when I was younger and I wrote short stories and it was hard to get published. Um, and I'm sure that's a question many writers here probably have, very hard to get published took a very long time, was extremely painful and frustrating. And I remember, you know, when I started with short poems and then short stories, um, and those are my probably my two great passions in writing and literature, but I remember my mother saying to me, it's so much easier to write a novel. How can that be? And, and but she was right. And it's really true. If, if you're a writer, and you've written short stories or poems, you might understand what I'm saying, which is that if you're writing a novel and you say that it's a 400 page novel, whatever it is, and of course you don't know that when you started, but that's what it's gonna end up being. And you start off and you, you, know, you write 10 pages one day and that's the end of it. And the next day you come back in the morning and you look at what you did and you start again. And the thing is that once you get into a little rhythm, you go to bed at night thinking of what you've already written and with those characters very much in your consciousness. 
and you go to sleep and whether you know it or not, you're dreaming about them and about it. And when you wake up, things are solved, you know, and you might not even know it consciously, but it's true. And so you get to your desk and you're, you know, it comes out your fingertips. And that is, I think that is what makes novel writing, I don't want to say easier, but it gives it a certain gift that anything that's more self-contained, like an essay or a short story doesn't have. And so that's my routine is really to try to get up in the morning and do it. And once it gets into a rhythm, you don't, you can't stop it. It's really like a steamroller. You won't even want to stop for lunch. You'll just be going and then you'll be exhausted and it's time for bed. That's definitely my experience. I love that you, um, that's your routine that you wake up and you try to write before you speak a word to anyone. Um, I love that because there's an, a kind of a magical ethereal sense to that. And uh, I just finished reading Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And she shares a few anecdotes where that is the case. That's where friends of hers have written whole novels where they just wake up and write things uh, mm -hmm. before the inspiration fairy flits off to somewhere else to some other artist. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's so great. There's so many for me, mysterious elements about sleep and dreams and the things that we work out in our minds that we need to while we're sleeping um, and can totally understand how that's applied to writing novels and working through plot holes. It's interesting. I So I don't know Liz Gilbert well, but I met her through um, a writer friend, Darcy Steinke from New York. She, we knew each other in New York. We had a, a very close mutual friend, Sister Leslie, who was an, an Anglican nun at a convent up in um, Harlem. And Darcy was friends with Liz Gilbert and Liz did a reading. This was back before Eat, Pray, Love came out at the um, Half King, which was a legendary writer's bar in New York City in Chelsea, okay. next door to where I live, next door to my apartment. So I used to go there all the time. Sebastian Younger owned it. And um, sadly, it's like, fall in the way of so many great New York places that were taken over by the billionaire condo movement. But at that time they had a reading series, I believe it was Monday nights and she was there. And it was like, I remember not really knowing her, you know, having met her through friends, but not knowing her as a writer or a speaker and hearing her speak and just her, she didn't exactly talk about what you're describing, but she had that sort of big picture, spiritual writing experience and way of like seeing the world in a much bigger way that I found very inspiring and, uh, and, you know, and, and electrifying really. So it's, it's so cool to hear. It certainly sounds it. That's so fun. I imagine you have all kinds of stories um, <laughs> living in, it sounds like the writer's Mecca of New York. Were there any other similar stories to that, maybe in that same location or elsewhere? Any other writer well, haunts? Well, let's see. So, I mean, in that very same spot, I mentioned Alice Hoffman earlier, and Alice um, lived a block away from me in Chelsea. We both were Chelsea girls and, you know, kind of grew up there essentially as young writers. And the writer, Anne Hood, who is from Providence, Rhode Island, uh, was also part of our group and she would not not a group I don't mean to say like it was a writer's group but part of our little trio our little coven and we would go to the half king quite a bit and also to the red cat a favorite restaurant um, you know and that was that was that was great and you know I was really lucky I had um, I god there's so many now you're like oh, who else who do you want to hear about <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I have no doubt yeah. Um, <laughs> my mentor, he was uh, the drama critic of the New Yorker magazine and he kind of, I was, I think I was 18 and I used to send short stories to the New Yorker and Brandon somehow, some, the, one of the fiction editors handed him one of my stories, I think because I was from Connecticut and everything I wrote about was Connecticut and Brandon was kind of a famous Connecticut native. And one day I got an, 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 a letter from him on New Yorker stationery. It was not an acceptance of a story, which was, you know, not as exciting, but it was pretty exciting. And he said, come to New York and have lunch with me at the Algonquin. And so I took 
the train in and I felt like I had nothing to wear. I felt like, you know, that's such a, a thing, but it was really true. Like, what do you wear to meet like this legendary literary figure at the New Yorker magazine? And I, I wore this dress that I had borrowed from someone that was too big for me, but I thought it looked good. And I had to like close it with, <laughs> and I wore a blue blazer that my grandfather Rice was the captain of the detectives in Hartford. And I, my father had his uniform hanging in his closet and I cut the buttons, the brass buttons off his uniform and sewed them onto my blue blazer because it had the Hartford seal on it. And Brendan was from Hartford. Oh, wow. That would be meaningful to him somehow. Um, and, you know, I went there and we sat in this banquet in the Rose Room at the Algonquin. And James um, William Sean was at the next table. He was the editor-in-chief. And John Updike was at another table. And Charles Adams what? was at another <laughs> table. And it was just, you know, the, I, and Brendan told me at the, on that day, he said, he called me dear child, dear child, you must leave Connecticut and move to New York if you want to have a literary life. And I did. I, I, <laughs> I, um, and I the next did, day, the next month, the next year. Wow. That day I got an apartment. No. That's incredible. <laughs> There's just, yeah, it's. That's so fun. I'm sure. I mean, there's a quote, and I, I really must figure out who said it at one point, but there's a quote that says, "Every my characters are inspired by everyone I've ever known. And I imagine that experiences like that must um, feed into your writing. Uh, I have to ask, where did you get the idea for a shadow box? Mm -hmm. I saw the title and I read your wonderful story and I immediately thought of moments that I have seen shadow boxes um, in galleries and as art displayed. Um, what inspired you to choose the shadow box as such a pivotal piece of this story? Um, well, the first one I ever saw was my grandmother who lived with us was named Mim. We called her Mim, Emily. But she had a friend named Mary Ristelli. And we would, I remember going with her to Mary's house when I was probably seven. And there was this object on the wall and it was a shadow box. And it was just like a little stage set, like a little tiny stage set. I'd never seen anything like it, but it told such a story, you know, and I was so like intrigued by it. And it also looked like something, I could maybe do something like this. Like I could make something like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then the shadow box in my book, um, Claire, the artist, uh, collects objects from her nature walks. And I wish I could carry my, my, I could actually carry it over to my bookcase and show you. Um, I, oops, I almost lost you. Are you still there? Yes, we're oh, still here. Oh, good. Um, I, you know, just things I pick up from my walks and that uh, crab claw on the beach, crab claws, little bits of rusty hinges, um, fish hooks, uh, pieces of lichen from, you know, from woodland trails. Uh, acorns, things like that, that just sort of captivate you and lead you to another place. And Claire is much more artistic about it than I am. I just line them up on the bookshelf. You know, I pick up moon shells, I pick up sea glass, and they're meaningful to me. And, you know, I still am, you know, spider crab carapaces. I still have one on the bookcase. I really do want to carry you over there, but I'm afraid the lighting's not going to work. But my grandmother, Mim, who lived with us, I remember she, you know, she picked things up and I still have hers on the bookcase. Wow. And, then, you know, you mentioned Shasti, our wonderful book designer. So, you know, she did this beautiful cover, which I feel is breathtaking. It's gorgeous. It really is. But then there's, on the hardcover, there's this little magic thing where you take the cover off. Which is even more breathtaking. I discovered that and just so, died. I loved it. <laughs> and, and there is a shadow box um i hope i wish i wish shasti would be watching this right now so she could hear our love for her um but it it's sort of like uh, just this little gift and this is one of the crazy things this is really true shasti never came to my house but this little thing up here it's a crystal and i don't believe i had anything in the book about somebody having a crystal on my bookcase, I have a crystal that looks exactly like this, 
that my friend, the actress Saffron Burrows, is one of my best friends, gave it to me for my birthday, maybe two or three years ago. And when I saw this, I really felt like, what kind of magic is this? Can you see it? And yeah. I, I feel like running to get it for you, but I haven't even told Sha Sha Saffron about this. I have to send it to her and, and show it to her. But then there's other things like little owl feathers and turkey feathers and, you know, like a little bottle that was found, like a message in a bottle and a, a blue crab claw. And, you know, is that seaweed? The detail is incredible. It's incredible. But it's also like if anybody watching this loves nature and goes on nature walks and picks things up that are, you know, meaningful to them in some way, like it, it can carry forward and in, in some, I think, almost indefinable, but maybe very definable way that it's right here. It's right there. It's real. Absolutely. I think that's very well put. Um, there's another question here that I think is really interesting since we're talking the shadow box. Edis wanted to know, will Connor Raid continue to be the detective in your thrillers? Well, may I first of all say hello to her? She is one of my favorite readers and friends from my town, from my 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 town that I call Black Hall. And she comes to many, many of my readings and we've known each other for lots of years. And she's a wonderful photographer. And she oh, gave wonderful. Me a sun, yep, she gave me a sunrise picture of the point right here at Hubbard's Point that I have in my house. Wow. And I'm very grateful to her. So I thank her for that question. And the answer, absolutely. Partly because I know how much you love him. <laughs> thank you for asking. Great it's question. Nice, it's nice to think of you here right now, Edith. Uh, Susan wanted to know, first she said that your photographs on Twitter are beautiful and they are. Uh, what is your favorite place to take photos? From my house. I'm very, very lucky. And I so I live, um, as I mentioned, in this house that my grandparents built. And it's a little tiny, you know, kind of humble beach cottage. But it overlooks a, a wide crescent beach um, over to like a wild area of woods. And so I, I probably go out there two or three times a day, every day, and take photos of the light as it changes. Um, and it's the same exact photo, but I take it during different times of day and light. So that's my favorite place is, is from home. But if there were another place, I would say anywhere that looks at interesting light. So, you know, either sunrise, sunset by some sort of water. Yeah, because the light can change the photograph depending on the time of day. I can see how you would take the same exact, well, take a photo from the same exact place, but have different outcomes from it. That sounds great. It's true. And, and just like a thing about that. So my mother was, you know, she was an she taught English, but she was also a writer and also a painter. And so we grew up very much like in the world of art. And she used to take us when we were young. We, we grew up in the winters in New Britain, Connecticut, which has a wonderful museum, um, one of the best museums of American art in our country. And, um, and also in Old Lyme, Connecticut, which is the birthplace of American Impressionism. And I feel really lucky because I go to, you know, I go to the Florence Grizzle Museum in Old Lyme and to the Cooley Gallery in Old Lyme, which is, I'm giving a shout out to them. If you get a chance, look up the Cooley Gallery on, on Instagram. They have absolutely beautiful paintings and photographs of paintings of our town. But um, that's where I really learned was how to look for light and how it affects art, you know, and how, and I feel like it affects writers. I don't know about you, Ella, I'm sure that where you live, but you, and, and, you know, you write so much about environment and about place and, uh, you know, the way that, the, you know, the water shimmers on the, the light shimmers on the Seine or reflects off the buildings in Paris. And, um, yeah. Absolutely. And speaking of your mother, uh, Leslie wanted to know, uh, was your mother able to enjoy any of your success? Oh, gosh, you're going to make me cry, Leslie. Um, she was, um, sort of, she was. She was a great supporter and she, um, she, was, she saw my first several books be published. Um, she was thrilled that any of them got published because as anybody who's a writer here knows, nothing is guaranteed. And uh, I worked really hard and I devoted myself to writing, but who knew if it would actually 
work out. And she, so, yeah, she was alive for a few of them. And the thing I miss about her, many things I miss about her, but one of the things I miss the most, and I wonder how you feel, Elle, but when you get those first moments in the publishing sort of prog right, process, um, you get the cover sketch, you get the second cover sketch, you get them, you know, the, your, your author photo, um, you get the page proofs, you see, you know, what typeset they're going to use. It's so exciting and thrilling and nobody enjoyed it more than she did. And I really miss being able to show her that. And she also would read my novels before they were published. Not every, I don't show them to that many people. I don't know about you, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to be very careful with that. But, um, but yeah, she did get to see and she was, she was very proud. And she met, you know, she met my agent, Andrea, who I've been with forever. And Oh, that's great. Yeah, she did. My, my mother loved Andrea. And I think, I know Andrea loved my mother too. So very lucky about that. That's wonderful. Um, Teresa had asked uh, earlier, I think prior to the beginning of this, what is your favorite, uh, what is the best piece of writing advice that you received and still use? And you said, write every day and then trust yourself. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hit on that again. And then speaking of which, Michelle wants to know, what is your writing routine and how do you stay motivated and on track with your projects? Is the key to that really writing every day? I think writing every day, a lot of coffee. Um, at night, herbal tea. I'm a big proponent of yogi tea and I drink it a lot. Um, it's very relaxing and sort of like it brings an end to the day. I think it's important to have a beginning of the day and an end to the day with writing because the beginning of the day, you know, it's not like another job. It just isn't like work from home. We all, and that's something, you know, cheers to everybody who's doing that. It, it, it changes everything for all of us. But I think because I've been doing this for you know, a very long time, like when did I start? I guess, I don't know, a long time. Um, it's my normal life, but even I feel how hard it is because we're, there's no choice to it. You know, it's not like, I, I, I mean, for most of my career and my adult life, I've been able to choose this is, I'm a writer, I'm working from home. I don't even think of it in those terms, but it's true. And I always sort of had to carve out little, ways during the day to make it special. And one was, and this is really, it so, sounds weird probably, but I get, I make the coffee before I go to bed and it's in, it's in my Cuisinart automatic coffee pot. The cats wake me up to feed them very, very early. I go downstairs, I feed them. I decide, do I need to go back to bed for an hour or not? If I do, I push the question. Yeah, you know, it's very tricky. Um, I like to be up for the sunrise. So, but they wake me up so early, depending on the time of year, it might be an hour before sunrise, but I, I love them. They're so, they sound so fun. They're so fun. I know. Why aren't they here right now? They were before, but, um, you know, so I, I hit the button, make the coffee and it's, it's a routine. It's like an important, I think it's important to have routines that work for you. Um, so it, and it, it probably just sounds so, you know, mundane, so nothing, but that, that works for me to carve out a little bit of the day. And then at the end of the day, like I knew that I was going to be meeting with all of you readers and librarians and library patrons and, and L and Robert. So I made myself, now it's cold, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, I made myself a cup of yogi tea and I thought I'm going to drink tea with them. And that's what I'm doing. And I do that at night. And I also, I am going to show you this. I did, I made a fire. Oh, how very atmospheric. Yep. Perfect and for a snowy night. Yeah, for a snowy night. So I like, I do, I like to do things that sort of carve out the day. And, you know, the fire, I never make it before four o'clock. It's sort of um, as the sun's going down or the light is changing and I need to feel cozier or something. I do that. And then, but I don't stop writing till the writing tells me it's time to start. Like there's to stop. There's not a done time where I just say, okay, you know, quitting hour. No, it might go till seven. It might go to eight. It might go to four in the afternoon. Who knows? But the thing is for me to, and this is really probably the most important thing I can say is be available to your work. Put mm -hmm. yourself in a place to be available to your work and to be available to the inspiration. And, you know, I think inspiration is very important and it's sometimes belittled, I think, in, in, in favor of 
you know, sit down, do it, make yourself do it. I actually think that inspiration is very important and you have to make yourself available to it, whatever it is and wherever it comes from and whatever brings it to you, you know, whatever that thing is. And um, I think that, you know, being online is a real detriment. I found that to be hard. And as somebody who, you know, who came up without any sort of social media or email or, you know, doing research online or anything. I think that that's been probably one of the greatest challenges is to make sure to fight that, either turn it off or mm -hmm. have the discipline to not look because it's really hard. It pulls you in, you know, so those Absolutely. are, uh, those are my, my personal things, but yeah. Yeah. Well put. Thank you for sharing. Um, that's great. Listening to the inspiration and, and also that ties back to trusting yourself, I think as well, and l knowing when to stop writing or when the writing is complete, I guess. Yeah. Um, Lauren, yeah. go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. Lauren similarly had another question about writing. She asks, how do you know when I, an idea is meant to remain an idea and when an idea needs to be made into a novel? Hmm. Well, and I'd like to hear what you think about that, Al, because um, for me, I, I don't think an idea has ever needed to be made into a novel for me. It's usually a character that, that comes to me that is saying, I want to be in a novel. And probably she embodies an idea. Probably she somehow incorporates or represents an idea. But to me, it's like a fully formed person or character. Um, but usually there is something, and, and she has a story, and it's not, it's not like, I think as I said earlier, I don't want to teach anybody anything or express anything important. I just want to tell the story, but generally that, that character has something to say. What about you, Elle? Um, I am, I am with you. I've had both sides of the coin um, with the missing sister. I really only knew my main character. She got out of a taxi in Paris and um, was really upset about something. And I <laughs> explored that. Um, it, it turns out she was upset about the death of her twin sister, which then um, evolves into a question of how her sister died and or whether or not she did, um, whether or not there's some kind of cover up in Paris. So I just knew the character to your point, And I knew that she had a story to be told. And then with uh, my second novel, which is coming out April 1st, Lies We Bury, I had an idea, a bigger idea um, derived from crew, uh, oof, true crime <laughs> and, uh, and then really uncovered more of it from there and, and the characters stemming from that idea and their lives 20 years into the future past the initial event. Um, so I've kind of done both and I'm not sure which one I gravitate toward more still being um, only in my second novel. So um, it's interesting to hear your perspective being so such a, a prolific um, and successful author as yourself um, saying that you really dig into the character and let the character kind of speak their truth to you. Can I just ask you when you just, you know, because I, I mean, that opening scene in The Missing Sister is so vivid. And when you, you know, when you speak about somebody the the taxi that moment with the taxi is that something that happened i mean isn't that a weird thing people ask us this all the time right like, Did I really? <laughs> and it's like well no we have imaginations but it was so real <laughs> to me God. I'm wondering, like did it really happen like with you i mean not that exact thing but was it a moment for you in real life um yes it it was um thank you that's very kind of you to say um i would say that it was that scene was derived from my own experience of moving to France. I um, moved to France thinking I would be there for nine months and then I ended up staying for three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that moment of getting out of the taxi and feeling extremely jet lagged and bewildered and unequipped, um, but excited was, that was my emotional state stepping out of the taxi when I moved to France at that point. Um, there was no, no real grief for me attached to it. So it's a different, a different experience than what I ended up writing, but that um, very strange jet lagged fueled, um, just bewilderment. Uh, I think anyone will know if they've traveled outside of their time zone 
doesn't have to be as significant as nine hours, um, will understand like that. Nine was, hours. Of course, I was like nine hours. Well, but yes, from West Coast to US. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. West Coast. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question. I think we have one more question. Um, two more questions. Uh, do you write on a computer or pen and paper? Which I think is a really great question considering you've done both, I'm sure. Yes. Um, it is. Okay. So I, I now write on computer, but for many, many years I wrote on uh, yellow pads, but mostly I wrote on typewriters, you know, because as I mentioned earlier, my father was a typewriter. Right, yeah. So I still have the Olympia typewriter he gave me when I was in grade school. Um, That's so special. Yeah, but as you know, Elle, I'm sure, makes it a whole lot easier to write on computers <laughs> and do editing. Yeah, I um, I admire people that still write novels um, by hand. My handwriting has just gotten completely just terrible, very legible um, between texting and computers, working on computers. Uh, I, I, so I, I think the downfall of handwriting occurred with the the um, sort of electronic signature thing where you just go, you're like, you know, I know it's terrible. I went to Catholic school where they taught you like this really great penmanship and uh, that's gone. <laughs> I'm sure it comes in useful in hand uh, uh, when you have to write cards. Yes, perhaps. If you but even finding yeah. books, I mean, what do you feel about sun? But don't, don't you find yourself like, I mean, I think about if you could compare the signatures of books now compared to the beginning of my career, be like, oh, I don't want to see that. <laughs> no less love in the signatures, but. Of yeah. course. Um, Mary Jane had another question. Uh, as you're writing characters that are close to home, have you ever had any interactions with someone where they have, where that person has assumed a character was about them or based on them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or in the case of where you do base characters on real people, if they've ever taken umbrage with something that you've written about? Um, I think it's, it seems to me to be somewhat common to have people see themselves in characters. And I mostly take that as a compliment, but, um, trying to think if there's anything really specific about that. I mean, I don't know about you, but I definitely draw on my emotions. So everything I write about is without question from my emotional life, something I feel. Um, and I'd say more often than anything that a character is born or is created from those feelings so that as opposed to looking outside myself like, oh, there's that person, I wanna write about them. It's more like, I feel this about whatever the event is or whatever the, you know, the circumstances and I you know, am going to write about it. And then the character comes to me often in a dream or in, you know, through my fingertips at the, at the um, computer. But circumstances in life can be more real, you know, like, something that's um, actually happened, you know, like that, as I mentioned earlier, that the murder that my family, you know, that my stepdaughter was a witness in, my ex-husband, um, that was an inspiration, but the, the characters in it were their own people because uh, the story just wasn't the same. If it was nonfiction, I would have written nonfiction. Right. Exactly. Uh, this is a kind of a, a tangential question, um, but could not be. Susan wants to know what inspires you to write? Life. Life. Life and love. Um, I, maybe, you know, if I were trying to be poetic, I would say, a desire to find answers, a desire to find truth, a desire to escape pain, all of the above, but it's really just, it's life. I don't know. It's, I feel like it's what I do. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, it's not a job. It's not a career. It's a calling. I mean, I guess it's like a religious calling um, where you just, it's what you have to do. And I get up and I have to do it. And some days where it's not satisfying, it's, it's, you know, it, it's not fun, but um, 
most of the time it is. And so I'm very lucky, very lucky. And I'm so lucky and, uh, you know, to have so many readers, you know, to have people who've come back and wanted to read my books and um, follow, you know, follow me. And I, I think that that's probably the, one of the best things that I'm 65. I'm, I'm, I am eligible for COVID vaccine now. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to have one soon. But I feel like that's the thing about getting to be my age as a writer, where I've done it my whole life, that the best part about it is to have the readers I have, and many of whom I'm sure are watching right now, um, you know, and who I love and care about, even the ones I haven't actually met. Uh, but I've met many of them because in the days pre-COVID, we would actually have, we would be doing this at a library and maybe we will be in a year or so, but um, it's such a great, great gift is to have that. And I didn't even know when I started off being a writer that that would be the thing, but it is the thing. It's a, it's like, I'm very lucky. It's an extended family. I love that. That's so well put. I think that is a great place for us to end tonight. Uh, we are past the five o'clock, or I'm sorry, eight o'clock hour, excuse me, five eight o'clock hour. <laughs> five o'clock over here. Um, <laughs> there's a phantom book that's okay. Yeah, Lies Be Fairy is coming out April 1. Thank you so much for holding that up again, Luann. Mm -hmm. I'm such a fan of yours and certainly loved the shadow box. This is out right now um, for all of you readers, librarians. Um, grab this if you haven't already. Uh, it's a beautiful book physically. And then also the pages are just nonstop thrills, very suspenseful. So I would highly recommend grabbing this. I think that if our publishers watching this, Elle, they should grab that phrase, nonstop thrills. And that should be on the paperback cover. I love that. Nonstop thrills. For, I mean, for mine, but yes, but for yours too. No. <laughs> this has been such a wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, just love talking to you and I, I, you know, just a sort of behind the scenes thing for our, for our viewers. Um, I've gotten to talk to Elle. Yeah, I've only gotten to know her through this whole evening and it's so exciting and so wonderful. And I feel really lucky to get to know you and I am your oh, biggest you. supporter and your biggest fan. And I want anybody who likes my books to immediately go to their favorite bookstore and pre-order Lies We Bury by Elle Marr and also check out The Missing Sister by Elmar. You will be so happy that you can. <laughs> there it is. Oh my gosh. Another great cover. Another great cover by Shasti. Thank oh, you. I that know. is so, <laughs> that is so, so kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If Shasti's listening, at, she if she's here, um, we are just such big fans of your, your art. Um, Thank you again for letting me join you tonight, Luann, to discuss the shadow box and uh, just all things writing in your incredible career. I've really enjoyed getting to know you and feel so lucky to have spent my Friday night with you. So thank you. And all the, the participants, the viewers um, in the Tewksbury Library and uh, Robert, thank you so much for, for having me. And a quick shout out to my friend, Susan McDonald. I just see that she's on here from Cape Cod. I love you, Sue. I adore you. No surrender. We're both big Bruce fans. Anyway, love to all of you. <laughs> Thank you all. And I'll be uh, ending the call in about five seconds. Okay. Great job, Elle. Great job, Luann. Thank you. You Good too. Good night, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone.